Ja, ja, ja. I need to call Surferas. Facebook. Yeah, yeah. First, let us check the if sound is so good. No, no, it is a guest. Mm. Yeah, yeah, one second, one second. You are on YouTube, right? Hello, hello, sound check, sound check. Okay. Mm. Just put up that uh, image in there. No? Yeah. Ah, it is on from OBS. Okay, let me try something. No, no, no. It. I muted myself on Teams. It is. It is uh, working from the streaming software. Can you hear something from my background? Some TV noise? Okay, okay. Then it's fine.
because
and uh, is a professor em emeritus of accounting and information systems at Virginia Tech and through the Office of Outreach and International Affairs at Virginia Tech he currently leads global initiatives in data analytics it's an area he's very passionate about uh, including several joint initiatives at NMIMS and now with SSA here in Middle East. Dr. Sain joined Virginia Tech in uh, 1995 and, uh, and spent he's a professor uh, emeritus, emeritus as a professor of and information systems at Virginia Tech. Tech. For the and through the Office of, of Outreach and International Affairs at Virginia Tech, Tech. he currently leads programs. global initiatives in data analytics. It's an area he's very passionate about, association uh, including, research, association uh, including several joint initiatives at NMI and application of analytics and data models to address business problems. Dr. Sain joined Virginia Tech in 1995 and spent he's a professor emeritus of accounting and information systems at Virginia Tech. the Office of Outreach and international affairs at Virginia Tech has been the leads of global initiatives and data analytics and he has participated in including several joint collaboration as BIR review panels. And he has over 30 publications and presented at over 25 national and international conferences, workshops and forums. And he has been a member of over 30 university and international committees. 
and developed and taught 15 courses in application of data and analytical models to business problems. Uh, he co-founded Antigens Corporation in 2002. It's a business intelligence and consulting company uh, based in Washington, D.C. area, as well as in Bangalore, India. And Antigens Corporation is a professional services company focused on providing data analytics strategies and solutions to higher education institutions and industry. He continues to be on the board of directors of Antigens and advises on new data analytics initiatives. Uh, he has a PhD in management information systems and an MBA from I. Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, as well as uh, uh, undergrad degree in mechanical engineering from IIT uh, Kanpur. We are very privileged to have Dr. Sain with us uh, uh, this evening, uh, morning for him <laughs> from where he is uh, joining us from, uh, from Virginia. Uh, we're very shortly, we will have Dr. Sain's talk. Uh, a quick uh, few notes about, uh, about the company I'm representing. Uh, my company is called SSA Business Solutions. We are a 20-year-old management consulting firm, uh, and I'm leading SSA in Middle East. Uh, my name is Naveen Narayanan, I'm Managing Director of SSA, uh, the local entity SSA International LLC. And I have about uh, 17 years of global management consulting experience, uh, primarily in the world of lean manufacturing strategy and change management. And I've led, uh, led a number of corporate-wide transformation programs with a number of global uh, prestigious clients like Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, who has now been making a lot of news with the vaccine. Hopefully some good news is around the corner. I just picked up on it before I logged into this webinar. So I'll congratulate my friends at Pfizer uh, with Nordel Networks, DHL, Gothrej, to name a few. Uh, I'm a Lean Six Sigma master black belt. This is something I've been very, very passionate about uh, uh, over the years, uh, working on real world problems, uh, uh, using data analytics and statistical methods and uh, you know, solving real world issues. And uh, another subject that I'm passionate about is lean, uh, lean manufacturing, applying principles of value stream mapping and theory of constraints and so on. Uh, I have an MBA in international business from Thunderbird, uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, master's in lean from the University of Buckingham. And currently I'm a doctoral research uh, student pursuing uh, the principles of uh, lead time reduction and applying lean principles and queuing theory and so on. So that's a little bit about myself. Uh, a quick glimpse about SSA. SSA was founded by NC Narayanan. Uh, NC started SSA in the year 99 uh, with a mission to help uh, Indian industries back then, uh, their quest for business transformation. As many of you may be aware that India was going through a balance of payment crisis in the early 90s, and there was a need for uh, you know turning around a number of Indian enterprises to make them focused on world-class practices, reduce cost, improve quality, and so on. So SSA was founded more with a missionary zeal to help the enterprises to deal with challenges. Uh, NC is a well-published author. He has written four books on uh, leadership, uh, change management, Lean Six Sigma, and so on. And he continues to uh, you know, lead the dialogue. Uh, he chairs a number of conferences globally, and he sits on a number of boards advising corporate uh, strategies uh, and helping industries to adopt uh, excellence practices uh, in order to achieve world-class performance. Uh, here are some of the key members of SSA running various units uh, of the firm and some of our board advisors representing some very prestigious, uh, you know, background. And uh, you know, over the 20 years, we have worked with about 24, uh, you know, you know, over 24 odd countries, uh, served about 1000 odd clients and achieved uh, over $500 million of validated savings. Uh, we are here local in Middle East, uh, you know, in Oman and UAE, and uh, we have local presence in Thailand, Sri Lanka, aside from India. Uh, and we are domain agnostic. We work with uh, clients from across sectors, as you can see, well represented by uh, sectors like pharmaceutical, logistics, oil and gas, uh, stock exchange, FMCG, telecom. Uh, so we are domain agnostic. Uh, what excites us is to work with industries on real world business problems, uh, help them to improve their systems and achieve sustainable improvements that contribute to the shareholder wealth. Uh, we are accredited with the International Association for Continuing Education and Training, so that gives global recognition to a lot of certification courses that we have to offer. Uh, so what excites us? Uh, you know, th these are some of the pillars that uh, we are very stoked about, and this is where we see the future of business improvement, uh, you know, going. Uh, we do a lot of work on strategy planning and execution. We are working on a number of clients, uh, helping them to articulate boardroom strategies, uh, three or five year vision, and translating them into execution plans. Uh, we also help industries on uh, implementing their IT change management, uh, ERP enablement, 
supply chain optimization is another area which uh, you know we have partnered with uh, demand oops with demand driven institute uh, helping industries improve their inventory turnover performance achieve higher service levels um, and overall uh, streamlined uh, supply chain operations uh, industry 4.0 another very exciting area that uh, we are working with a bunch of clients on lean manufacturing and services and data science and performance management and this is uh, this is something we will delve uh, deeper in today's session in terms of how data science how uh, how elements of ai and uh, data science can help an industry to really achieve a competitive edge uh, well of course i will leave doctor leave this to dr sain to really delve deeper into how data science and information um, systems can help to uh, help a business to achieve competitive advantage uh, clearly the way we see it from a, a systems thinking perspective is two levers of information and material flow and both of these are crucial for most businesses uh, uh, to be able to fulfill customer need to be able to generate profits and return on investment uh, and we will learn more about how data science can help a business to make better decisions and how it can help a business to achieve competitive advantage uh, by uh, em embracing elements of data science and ai so why are we here together i'm very excited to announce ssa's partnership with virginia tech uh, you know uh, we uh, came together uh, some months ago to uh, to really uh, team up in offering uh, data science to industries uh, here in the region uh, and uh, you know this is this is right up our alley in terms of what we do at ssa uh, and virginia tech has cutting edge capability uh, in this science and we see a perfect fit in what virginia tech has to offer and therefore we uh, came together to collaborate uh, in in offering data science as a subject our our mission really is to educate and empower industries and individuals of course to leverage the power of data science and ai and the way we aim to do that is through these four levers of uh, of training readiness deployment and adaptation so uh, we have a bunch of very interesting exciting uh, modules that we have put together as training courses that one can go through and get certified and get accredited uh, on the foundational principles of data science and ai and uh, but our larger aim is to help industries to use this valuable science uh, to to improve their real world decision making processes uh, and therefore help to generate greater value from their businesses so this is where we aim to leverage uh, our combined strengths between ssa and virginia tech and we also have a bunch of certification courses my colleagues can talk more about uh, this uh, maybe now after the session or later on uh, we could exchange notes uh, we we are for instance this is one of the courses that we have come up with uh, uh, which is starting early next month uh, which is uh, the virginia tech certified uh, uh, you know or virginia tech certificate in data science and ai uh, it's a three day course that is being offered uh, of course uh, you know it's a faculty led course but it's going to be done uh, through uh, microsoft teams and online interactions uh, but it's one of the most highly rated courses of virginia tech uh, i highly encourage you to uh, look into it and i'm happy to get my colleagues uh, get in touch with you and explain uh, what's in store and this is something coming up uh, very shortly so i won't take too much of your time now uh, i will uh, uh, Dr. Sen has been patiently waiting for me to stop. Uh, Dr. Sen, over to you, sir. <laughs> Looking forward to your presentation, uh, Dr. Sen. Thank you, uh, Naveen, uh, and good evening uh, to all of you. That was a, a, a very nice introduction to the talk and the presentation today. Um, before I start, let me make sure that I can uh, share my screen. So I'm going to start doing that. Okay, I think we are set. Uh, can all of you see my screen? Yes, it is. It is visible, Doctor Singh. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so, as Naveen pointed out, uh, we are um, talking about this uh, data science and AI um, uh, certificate program that uh, Virginia Tech offers, uh, but. You know, more than the certificate program, uh, what uh, my role over here, or what I would li really like to talk to you about, is the excitement behind uh, data science and AI, and why is it of such importance today in industry? 
So uh, before I uh, go into that part of the presentation, um, let me talk a little bit about Virginia Tech. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Virginia Tech and, and some of you may not, but I'd like to just give you a, a broad overview of, uh, uh, of the university. Um, even before I give you the overview, there is uh, uh, one reason for, uh, for, for giving, uh, giving you this overview. If you're going to talk about data science and AI, uh, it is a highly interdisciplinary field. And it is uh, very difficult for any organization to come up with a, a small department or a, or a local uh, body of people to create this uh, data science and AI environment. Similarly, for an institution like Virginia Tech, um, it requires the participation of multiple departments, multiple colleges, and multiple academic arenas to basically get together and uh, develop a program in data science and AI. And I'll try to demonstrate that. Uh, another challenge we face in developing uh, these programs is that uh, it has to be highly applied uh, because the field is moving at a very rapid pace. And that is why um, collaborations uh, like the one that Naveen just talked about is very important that industry collaborations is vital in being able to provide <laughs> uh, data science and AI um, uh, educational programs, whether they are degree programs or certificate programs. In either case, that uh, uh, collaboration is, is quite important. So um, we are uh, a global university established in 1872, uh, so fairly old. We have a very large body of students. We have 31,000 students, 1,400 full-time faculty with PhDs, uh, nine colleges and 140 departments. We have over 250,000 uh, 50, alumni spread over 100 countries. And we have several campuses uh, in Blacksburg, in, in Falls Church, uh, uh, and these are in Virginia, uh, Arlington, Alexandria, Roanoke, Richmond, Hampton Roads. And then also we have several centers across the world uh, in Switzerland, uh, Chile, India and Botswana. And as we speak, there are several such centers being developed in other parts of the world. Our main campus is uh, located in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, which is about 250 miles southwest of uh, Washington, D.C. As I said that we have multiple colleges and we, I wanted to demonstrate the comprehensiveness of the university. We have nine colleges covering pretty much all areas, academic areas that you can think of, uh, except for one, which is law. But otherwise, um, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, College of Architecture and Urban Studies, the Pampton College of Business, where I come from, basically, uh, where I was a faculty member for over 25 years. Um, then the College of Engineering, College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, College of Natural Resources and Environment, College of Science, the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine, and the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine and Research Institute. So we have medical schools, vet schools, uh, engineering schools, business schools, uh, agricultural schools, and so on and so forth. So we are pretty much um, diverse in terms of the academic areas uh, that we cover. And so given that, uh, you know, we can uh, pick on resources as we need to develop uh, an integrated program in, in something like data science. And specifically about me and what role do I play uh, in this initiative, uh, I think that's also important because a lot of the initiatives that I'm uh, participating in or that I'm developing uh, worldwide um, uh, in the data analytics and in the AI space, of course, we are not limited to that particular space. We can go beyond that, but my particular expertise lies in that particular area. So that's why my current focus uh, on that. But where do I come from? We come from a division called the Outreach and International Affairs Division at Virginia Tech. Right. So the uh, Outreach and International Affairs, basically, uh, their role in, in Virginia Tech is to offer executive and professional development programs in the U.S., outside the U.S., worldwide, you know, anywhere, essentially. And we have several educational uh, executive and professional development programs um, as we speak. Um, we build global collaborations uh, and establish Virginia Tech's global presence in education, research, and outreach. Those are our three primary prongs 
on which the educational institution basically operates education research and outreach research being very dominant uh, our education and outreach are both tied to uh, research in a very dominant manner um, and, uh, and also broadly speaking we administer and establish global research and education centers across the world and like for example this partnership that we are developing in the middle east basically is a, a part of that particular uh, particular effort So now, uh, letting, uh, getting into the uh, into the meat of the presentation. Um, so, um, you know, I would of course very much appreciate it if you have questions uh, regarding uh, the talk, uh, especially on data science and AI and other topics that you might uh, want to bring up. Um, so, what are we really talking about over here? What is this buzz going around on, on this data? Uh, today we heard data science. Yesterday we heard artificial intelligence. The day before it was data analytics, and the, you know the day before that was business analytics. So, so, what the heck is really going on over here? Are they just buzzwords? Uh, well, you know, I've been in this field since my uh, I am Bangalore days, uh, where I first got interested in this interface between information technology and business, basically. And at that time, we used to call it management information systems. But the, the challenge is related to the use of information and decision making and making our lives better and so on and so forth. There's nothing new. And none of these things that we are talking about, artificial intelligence, uh, data science, uh, analytics, and so on and so forth, none of this is really new. This is, in fact, AI was first uh, conceived of in the 50s. So, uh, so if someone's telling you that artificial intelligence is something that just cropped up in the last few years, that's not true. Industry has a way of basically uh, coming up with uh, new uh, uh, concepts uh, or new, uh, uh, I don't like to call them buzzwords, but new uh, uh, thrusts of emphasis basically. And that helps them market and also allows professionals in the industry to, uh, to hang on to an anchor that tells them uh, about the newest development that's going on. So from an academic perspective, uh, we find this relatively common and it's been going on for, for a lot of years. But as professionals, as you come into the professional world, you find that newer and newer concepts are thrown in. But um, at the end of the day, um, I want you to understand that the underlying theories behind this has been uh, well thought out and has been around for a, a fairly long period of time. It's not something that was developed yesterday. but Having said that, the applications of this is rapidly increasing, basically, and is rapidly increasing at a pace that uh, would not have been possible unless the, the, there was a significant amount of investment that's going on. And frankly speaking, the investments are enormous in this data science and AI space. So, um, so what should we call it? Uh, data science? Uh, should we call it artificial intelligence? Should we call it data analytics? Should we call it business analytics? So let me just give you a brief background about where these terms come, come from. AI is an academic discipline that was created way back in the 50s. And the idea was that computers are, can be made to process information and in quotation mark think basically like humans do. Uh, of course, at the same time, we don't even really know how human, human, humans actually think. So making a computer to work like a human being is probably nearly impossible, basically. However, we can uh, talk about the way we process information and the way we use logic and the way we express this logic and the processing of information and, and codify it in the form of artificial intelligence. So that's typically what's, what's been done. So AI really comes from that particular area. Analytics is the use of any kind of models to solve a problem. And these models can be mathematical models, uh, well-structured mathematical models, or they could be algorithmic models that computer science basically uses. So analytics is also a very broad term, and data, of course, is an extremely broad term. So now the combination of data and analytics is also relatively very, very broad. Now, when data analytics is applied to business, it's called business analytics, right? Now, where did the term data science come from? Now, 
in the recent past, in the last few years, uh, AI and statistical methods, which also lie in some kind of a continuum, basically, have been extensively used in the data analytics area. And that uh, resulted in the need for a term that basically was different from just statistics and artificial intelligence or machine learning and so on and so forth. So uh, industry came up with this term called data science, which basically encompasses all these different kinds of models that exist in these domains that I just talked about. Statistics, operations research, artificial intelligence, and one co component of artificial intelligence is also machine learning, which you also probably hear about all the time. So they're not exactly buzzwords, but they are words basically that help us understand to some extent what is going on under this, uh, under this umbrella. Most important uh, takeaway from this is it's a multidisciplinary field. It's not a field that comes from one particular discipline and it's not a new, new discipline. It's an integrated discipline of multiple uh, areas. And the good thing and the great thing about it is the future of business uh, growth today is lies in this particular area. And again, having said that, it's really not new again. If you look at the growth of the uh, of industry in general in the last 20 years, it's been in the information technology area. Uh, the, the internet basically promoted a lot of the growth. And now we basically are seeing that new technologies, so-called data science and AI technologies are essentially now going to promote the uh, the growth of business uh, now, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future. So that gives you a general idea of re regarding where these terms come from. So having said that, now I'm going to just broadly call this uh, word data analytics, okay? And let's look at the world of data analytics and see uh, what's, what's, uh, what, is, what is it composed of. As I said uh, right, right before this uh, slide, that the, what we are trying to do since the advent of information systems is really the integration of data, technology, and models to make better decisions, make our lives easier, increase efficiency, solve business problems, or you know, governmental problems or whatever the case might be. So it's the application of technology and data and models, the integration of these three basically to make our lives better, okay? So if you look at it from that uh, overall concept, then you see that it's not that difficult to understand what is going on over here. So in the data analytics framework, there are four uh, broad components, um, models, the technology, the data and the domain component. So in the models component, basically there are two areas from which we derive uh, models. One from computer science, typically AI, and within AI, machine learning, that's where we basically pick up a lot of the models. And the other area is statistics. So statistics and, and machine learning and AI are the sources of our models. In some cases, we also use uh, OR techniques uh, operations research techniques, and that's typically related to optimization, uh, maybe forecasting methods and things like that. Um, but that's a relatively small in terms of the, the, the usage of models from various areas in the analytics domain. These models alone are useless unless you have a technology that drives them. So understanding the technology uh, is very, very important in order to create a a data analytics organization. So this technology comes in various forms. Cloud, of course, is extremely important in this particular environment because the environment is moving so rapidly that to create your own platforms and environments is going to be extremely, extremely difficult and you have to use cloud platforms to essentially uh, create your environments. Then there are languages that are taking uh, taking over or making it uh, very easy for uh, the analytics area to spread uh, uh, faster. And these languages are Python, R, and so on and so forth. For more data structured, uh, uh, more structured analysis, we've got business intelligence tools and visualization tools. And then deep learning is basically one component of AI that's actually being extensively uh, used um, in industry today. And I'll give you an example of that shortly. Now, data, of course, without data, none of this is going to work. 
So data engineering, as some of uh, some people are calling it, is also very important in this particular domain. So under data engineering, you have data that is that could be structured, that could be unstructured, it could be in basically warehouses, data lakes, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of technology involved in the data uh, component of the analytics world. And the fourth component, of course, is basically what problem am I solving? And that's where the domain comes in. It could be marketing, it could be finance, it could be manufacturing, it could be customer relationship, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of domains in which this can operate. Um, is there any question uh, at this point of time? Uh, I can sh uh, take a short pause over here. I, I don't see any questions yet posted in the chat, uh, Dr. Sen. I will keep monitoring the chat uh, and I encourage the uh, participants also uh, to please uh, keep uh, posting uh, your questions in the chat and you know I'll, I'll interject uh, uh, as and when uh, they come up. Okay, that's great. So please do so because you know that will essentially help me uh, direct the conversation uh, in uh, you know uh, in a direction that would be useful to the audience audience sure so uh, the dimensions of data analytics this slide basically just describes what i just talked about so i'm not going to go through this slide i'm going to come to the next one so if you are a mid to senior level executive in a in a in an organization and you want to bring in this uh, bring in data science and AI applications in your organization to solve uh, your problems or to create uh, new environments that might basically create market opportunities for you. How do you go about doing this? So uh, if you look at the research and the literature behind this uh, from practitioners, of course, there is this new concept that they're talking about is to create a, what is called a chief artificial intelligence officer or a CAIO basically. Um, and of course, there is also a reaction to it um, saying that the CAIO does not really solve the problem exactly like the fact that the CIO never really solved the information problem. The chief information officer eventually landed up being the chief technology officer. The information, uh, what you call management, was handled by an integrated team across the organization. Uh, so it's not necessary that having a CIO or a CTO or something, someone like that will solve all your problems. So that's why I did not uh, use the term CAIO or something like that to say, okay, that's where you need to start. Uh, I think the way, you know, I'm leaving that to you uh, as organizational experts and as senior executives and mid-level executives to decide basically how you want to lead this AI initiative. Do you want to lead it as a team? Do you want to lead it as a person who can build an integrated team or a multidisciplinary team? But those are challenges that all organizations will face. And if nothing else, find a point, uh, a point person basically uh, like the CI, CIO who builds the integrative team. This integrative team, again, has to come from all these areas. It's, it's, it's very important that they come from all these areas. Because if they don't, um, then you really don't have what I was talking about, a data analytics organization that can be built. So the data science and AI organization, okay, is primarily in this particular area. You know, this is where we are getting all the models. So these are the data and AI scientists, okay? So these are experts from the statistics area, from the machine learning area, and so on and so forth, okay? So these are your scientists, basically. So they can do predictive analytics, they can do statistical analysis, they can apply machine learning algorithms, they can apply optimization techniques, and so on and so forth. They understand the, the, the algorithmic world of data science and artificial intelligence. Why do I keep using data science and AI and not just data science? Um, there's a reason why I keep using the, both of them. Um, a lot of the claims on data science have essentially been made by statisticians and predictive analytics folks, basically. So uh, in order to avoid that confusion and, uh, and basically say that, well, data science is much more than just predictive and statistical analysis, AI plays a, plays, plays a major role in data science is extremely important to highlight. So I don't want to undermine the importance of AI because AI is really what is driving the data science world today. 
Dr. Saint, we have a question. Can I take one now? Sure, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So the question is, how far will the data analytics uh, help in procurement of goods, inventory management, logistics, until the go goods get delivered to the end, end user? Um, in a in a lot of ways, basically. In fact, uh, in fact, one of my first uh, areas uh, where I actually uh, practiced um, when I was in industry years back was in uh, materials management, and um, in that particular area, there are a lot of challenges. Basically, starting with uh, you know procurement, basically, and in procurement, essentially, how much do you procure? When do you procure? What should your lead time be? What is uh, just-in-time procurement and stuff like that? For example, if you want to do just-in-time, uh, you know, a procurement, basically, you need a massive information system that actually drives it. So, for example, if you look at what Amazon is trying to do, Amazon is, of course. They have tried essentially not to have their own warehouses and basically get a um, uh, product shipped from uh, from uh, the manufacturing site to a client without having a, a warehouse. Of course, that's a challenge. But in order to remove the warehouse, basically, you need intelligence to be able to take the uh, the uh, the material down to the source at uh, location at which it's going to be used. So. Actually, in this area, uh, there's a lot of automation that can be done. Another example, years back, I was at a John Deere uh, plant. They may manufacture tractors, and I, I would say this is about 30 years back, and they had actually robots doing their uh, materials management, essentially. So what this, uh, this robotic uh, environment did was they had this massive, uh, I would say, you know, three, four-story bins, and these, uh, these robots... Uh, were instructed by a central control, and the robots would essentially go, and these ro robots don't look like human beings, they're actually trolleys, basically. They would go to a particular bin location, and using an elevator to go to an exact particular bin, which is, and these bins are organized as, as grids, basically, with X, Y coordinates, is, you can think of it that way. And then these uh, robots would essentially go uh, and pick the material from that particular bin, bring it down to the floor, and then using tracks, take it to the actual place where this particular material was being used in manufacturing in, in the shop floor. Now, so you can see that the uh, applications out here are massive in the procurement space and in the materials management space. But, you know, the question is, do we all have the wherewithal to do all this? Um, the answer is no, basically, because it requires a tremendous amount of um, of, uh, of uh, resources to do it. So um, unless, uh, you know, the, the organizations are very, very large, they are not able to really mobilize these resources. But just to add to that, I am, I haven't really done any research on this particular area, but I am positive that there are products that are available, you know, in the open source market that can allow you to make your process much more streamlined than it is. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, if you have a follow-up question, we can take that um, also uh, beyond this. But I guess the area that you picked up was pretty broad, so you know it has to be. We have to narrow it down to a certain area where an application can be thought of. Thank you, Dr. Sain. I'll, I'll probably there are a few more questions. I'll I'll probably let you to <laughs> cover a few more slides, and then I will interject with a few questions. Uh, in the sure. Show. Yeah, I think that that'll be that'll be great. Otherwise, we'll get stuck stuck on the slide. Sure. So uh, the second area, like I said, uh, the technology. Without the technology, don't even bother, because you know, like I said, data science, predictive predictive analytics, statistics, machine learning. These are all very old, uh, you know, concepts. It's the technology that has brought them to the forefront, and that's what is making it possible for us to do the kinds of things that we want to do. For example, in that uh, procurement area that we talked about, if we had to build this technology from scratch, forget it. The, the, and no organization really has the resources to keep, keep doing this uh, kind of stuff, which does not really directly produce sales, but it essentially improves the efficiency with which we operate. So for efficiency management, to use a lot of AI and data science is only, uh, you know, it's a luxury only only that uh, that that only very large organizations can afford, basically. 
So uh, on the technology front, uh, cloud, cloud and security is, of course, going to be very, very important. Uh, Python is extremely important because, in, fortunately, in this particular world, what has happened is that uh, the Python is an open source programming language. A massive number of libraries have been developed in Python that goes from predictive analytics to the statistical analysis to machine learning, optimization, just name it, visualization. It's all available in these Python libraries. And these libraries basically, are, I don't even know what the growth rate of these libraries are, but they're massive. So be, to be able to leverage Python libraries to do what you're trying to do uh, is, is very important. Similarly, R has, a, R, has, R has a basis from statistics. It's also a very user-friendly language or a user-friendly environment. A lot of uh, data scientists use R, so I thought that these two areas one ought to be familiar with. But I also want to bring you back to the cloud uh, environment. On the cloud, for example, Amazon, Google, and other players, Microsoft, and so on and so forth, they have cloud AI environments, basically. So you don't even need to basically create your AI environment. You can actually go directly into their AI environment and run the AI and uh, predictive analytics programs on that particular environment. So, um, and then BI and visualization, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on BI and visualization, but BI, uh, business intelligence and visualization is extremely important because the structured data domain is still alive today. And a large portion of our data domain is really structured, basically. It's data that is produced through transactions that uh, businesses basically have that produce their revenues, right? So, uh, you know, so, so uh, analytics related to that can't be uh, foregone. That particular area is also very important. Then, of course, like I said, if you don't have the data, what are you going to apply the algorithms on? So data engineers are extremely important and they can come in various forms, uh, structured data, you know, structured data environments, unstructured data environments. In the BI uh, space there, the, we have data warehouses, data lakes and so on and so forth. So the data division also is important basically in this environment. And finally, your functional experts. Without these guys, uh, you know, these three are going to be a problem. This one is probably the most important. And I can go back to my engineering days, basically. And one of the things that I learned as an engineer, basically, when I was in IIT Kanpur, was that most of what we were talking about was in theory. And one day, I mean, you know, most of us realized that if we can't put this into practice, if there's no buyers for any of the engineering that I do, really that engineering is going to stay at home in our workshops, and that's it. So whatever you develop, Whatever you basically throw at, you know, you have to have either basically process efficiencies that result in uh, some uh, dollar uh, 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 value generation or basically it produces new revenue for you. So it is essentially going to be dollar driven and basic dollar meaning currency driven. Uh, and of course, this, this uh, motivation will come from your domain and functional experts. Okay, so that component is very, very important. So don't build an organization with just technologists and data scientists and engineers and hope that things will work out. If you don't have a need or if you don't have basically a future in initiative that you're essentially looking at, then really uh, just don't build the organization and hope that things are going to work out. Okay, it has to be driven by basically a business need. So having said that, uh, I was... Um, asked by Naveen, and maybe uh, this uh, might not be very relevant, but also at the same time, I think it does uh, give you a sense of the applications that are going on in different domains. So I'm going to just give you a, a, a snapshot of the applications in finance and banking uh, that's been going on. Now, again, a large number of these applications have been going on for years. You know, it's getting attention today. So, for example, the applications in finance and banking have started way, way back in the 80s and 90s. So, this is uh, the application itself has been basically relatively old, but it's uh, it's uh, 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 what do you call uh, it's uh, 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 view from the consumer side is only has only been recent. But, and bank, uh, but the banking industry and the finance industry has been using a lot of algorithms to do different kinds of things that they need to do. So one of the applications that you see nowadays are chatbots, uh, and these chatbots are basically text-driven systems. 
and uh, they can come in the form of a personal financial assistant. For example, Capital One has an environment called Eno that basically provides financial assistance uh, using chatbots to uh, uh, to a customer. Okay. It can also be used for wealth management. A lot of the financial institutions use use it for wealth management to advise customers. So chatbot is basically something that can be used for uh, giving financial advice. How do we do this? Now, this is where the models come in. And that's why if you notice right below that, I've essentially said something over here. I put this thing called NLP. It's called natural language processing. Okay, so uh, what is natural language processing? So this morning, I was listening to some Christmas music, and I, uh, I have uh, Alexa basically at home, and I said, Alexa, play uh, Christmas music. And of course, Alexa went and played Christmas music. And uh, how, did, how, did it, uh, how did Alexa do that? Through natural language processing. Alexa understood what I was saying, okay? Interpreted it, converted that into a controls. Uh, it essentially accessed data, first of all, okay? and then converted that into controls that activated the Christmas music. But look how sophisticated these systems have become. I told Alexa that I want the, the volume reduced. So Alexa reduced the volume. And I basically said, Alexa, reduce the volume even more. So it reduced the volume even more. And I wasn't very ha happy. So my wife said, why did you say uh, Alexa volume three? And sure enough, and I said, basically, I, I said, Alexa, volume three. And Alexa took it to, this is precisely what I wanted. So you can see how uh, how important these technologies have become. When you look at Alexa, you don't really think about it. You think that Alexa is something like a gadget that was built, you know, yesterday by a few geeks sitting together. The same thing, if it had to be built 30, 40 years back, would require multiple supercomputers to actually uh, to, uh, to actually execute. But today, it can be executed in a small little box, basically. Of course, the box communicates with something that's beyond it, basically, right? And that's why the cloud environment and so on and so forth becomes important. But as far as the technology is concerned, or as far as the algorithms are concerned, it comes from something called natural language processing. Then let's take another, another area, consumer finance, okay? In that area, fraud detection in online transactions, very important for all banks, and all major banks have this. And it's not new. This has been going on for a long, long, long time. How do you de determine uh, you know, fraud? Now, again, there are multiple ways of doing it. You can use statistics. But the more sophisticated than statistics is basically using machine learning, because machine learning can actually take care of much more complex relationships than statistics can, act, uh, can actually do. And one component of machine learning in, in here that's very important is uh, basically our neural networks. And I'll briefly touch upon neural networks shortly. Risk assessment, loan evaluation. You go to a bank, you, you apply for a loan, you know, loan officer basically evaluates you, but nowadays actually there are machines that evaluate you basically. And where does this come from? Again, through machine learning, okay? What the machine learning algorithms do is that they're given tremendous amounts of data about past loan uh, performance, and it learns from that data to determine basically which one is going to be a good loan and which one is going to be a bad loan. And they can do that much better than humans can, basically. So risk assessment, loan evaluation has done that way. Algorithmic trading, it's been around for a long, long time. No one's going to tell you what these algorithms are, right? Because that's how these hedge fund managers may essentially make money. But Again, uses machine learning, decision tree algorithms, predictive analytics. Portfolio advisors, hedge funds, same thing. NLP, decision trees, machine learning, and in some cases, sentimental analysis. But sentimental analysis or sentiment analysis is, again, a, an offshoot of natural language processing, which I just talked about earlier. Okay, And finally, security and identification. This basically uh, comes from uh, applications of image recognition or you know, visual, basically. Uh, how do you recognize images? What do you do with images? How do you interpret Im Im images? How do you do visual recognition and so on and so forth? So a lot of visual recognition systems, again, based on machine learning, are used in the security and identification area. Okay. So uh, let me... Uh, let me show you something that uh, I think I skipped while I was uh, doing this. 
Um, I wanted to show you an application. That, as pub that was published in uh, New York Times. And um, this gives you an idea of what, uh, what's going on. And I'm sure a, a lot of you have seen this, thing, uh, seen this. This is an application of neural networks, a particular kind of neural networks called uh, generational, generational adversarial networks or GANs to do image recognition, okay? But in the process of doing image recognition, these researchers actually found out that it can do something even more interesting. It can change images and see what it can actually do. So I'm passing my cursor on and look at the same person can be modified into any of these images. And, it's, and most of these images are not real images anymore. Okay. And then not only can you do this, you can do things like this. I mean, of course, you have seen this kind of stuff in Facebook and stuff like that. You can take an image and change the person's age. You can take uh, an image, change the person's eyes. You can take uh, uh, an image and basically change the perspective of the image. You can change the mood of a person. You can do all kinds of stuff with, uh, with an image. And these are done through image recognition systems. OK? So I wanted to just uh, show you that so that um, although I'm talking about, uh, you know, things that seem to be, uh, you know, relatively straightforward, but in terms of its application, they are really not that uh, easy to basically see how they work. So what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is to give you an idea as to how these things actually work, basically. For example, image recognition, natural language processing, and so on and so forth. Let's take a very simple take a question now. We'll, uh, we yes, yes, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So there is a question that says, how dependable is AI in making business decisions? More dependable than human beings to, 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 in, in a lot of cases. Uh, for, for, for example, one thing that we lack, human beings lack, basically, is consistency in our decisions. Okay. Uh, so, um, so, you know, but there are certain things that we do extremely well. So I'll give you an example of things that we do extremely well. We can see, right? And then what, what do we mean by seeing? When I look out of the window, I see some bricks, I see some trees, I see seal, all kinds of stuff, right? Even without having to recognize them. That, that concept of sight is going to be extremely, extremely difficult for AI to basically, you know, deal with. But now let's say I, I'm seeing these uh, collection of bricks outside, okay? And I have a need to count the number of bricks. AI systems can do it much faster, much more accurately than I can basically do it. So you see, basically, there are a lot of business areas where AI systems can actually do things a lot better than human beings can. can. But if you try to make AI systems do everything that humans, can, humans try to do, then you're probably not going to succeed. Let me give you another example of why um, uh, we have this bias that, uh, you know, uh, when we use a computer language, we don't see what's going on. Uh, when we use a neural network, we don't see what's going on. So how can we depend upon this decision? Okay. So you can keep saying that, but suppose a machine is able to, based on data, is able to recognize or do something with 99.5 accuracy, percentage accuracy, and a human being actually does it with 90% accuracy. Unless you're really biased with some other piece of information that the machine doesn't have and that you have, there is no reason for a human being to do that task as contrasted to a machine. So yes, what I'm trying to say is it really depends upon the task. It really depends upon basically the accuracy in which, with which the machine performs and the accuracy with which the 
which the uh, human being performs, basically. And if the accuracy that the machine is better, then I would rather use the machine than the human being, although the human being's, uh, the, the person's ego might be hurt. But, you know, uh, I think we should not get our ego to be uh, between the machine and us, because definitely we're much more superior than the machine. For example, the machine can't see, right? Or, or a basic task like that. For example, the, for the machine to pick up something is going to be a lot more complicated than basically uh, for a human being to do. So we are a lot more adaptive than a machine can will ever be, basically. So there are tasks that businesses can essentially make machines do better than, uh, than, um, than humans. Does that answer your question? Sure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps another a quick question. And how much we rely on unstructured data for management decision making when processes are unique? What will be the mix, mix of structured and unstructured data? That's a very, very good question. Um, um, we have been, uh, computers were really good at handling structured data because the models that we were given to store and manage data uh, basically were uh, defined or dictated by the uh, structured paradigm. But as we, uh, as the internet uh, grew and as the proliferation of data grew massively, trying to take this data and structure it before processing was a uh, non-starter. So if you take all the data that is being generated through, you know, your emails and text messages and so on and so forth, if you try to structure all this data and then analyze it, you know, essentially even our today's computing power is not going to be able to do that. Okay, because the structuring process can be extremely complicated. So you have to deal with unstructured data. And with um, the new technologies that are available on the unstructured data side. So for example, you must have heard of big data and under, under the big data umbrella, there are several database environments uh, that can handle unstructured data relatively well. And these AI algorithms can, can talk to these big data environments in a very sophisticated manner. And they've been, they have been, the big data environments have been created with, a, with AI and uh, you know, large volume anal analytics in mind, basically. So as a result of which, the marriage of these two are working relatively well. So yes, uh, you have to, in your data division that I showed you, basically out of the four, you have to have uh, the ability to deal with unstructured data if you're going to create applications of your own for your, for your company. But if you're buying applications from uh, elsewhere, look, for example, the Alexa thing that I was uh, talk talking to you about, or that image recognition thing, thing that we saw in uh, uh, New York Times, those are all canned applications that are available, basically. So you don't really have to start from scratch. So you don't have to deal with structured, unstructured data, because that's really Amazon's data or someone else's data. But if it's your data, Yes, you have to look at the unstructured data world. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, um, so next two slides, I'm going to just try to give you an insight into how all this works. I'm going to start, start very simply, okay? First, I'm going to say that uh, what's predictive analytics all about? What are we trying to predict, basically? Well, we are trying to predict something. Okay, the objective is to derive a predictive model where Okay, and I'm just going to use a simple algebraic equation to show how this thing starts off and where y is, the, is what we are trying to predict and y is equal to a, a, line, a simple linear function, a plus b1x1 plus b2x2 plus b3x3. This is an example. And we want to come up with this model. So now we're calling this a model. We're calling it a statistical regression model, let's say. We want to come up with this model with certain constraints in mind. And the constraint is, uh, constraint is such that the prediction y has the minimum amount of error. So look at these points over here. These are basically uh, the actual data points for a relationship between a, a dependent variable y or a predicted variable y and an independent variable x. These are actual data points. But in order to come up with a map or an or a, a algebraic function that maps this non-linear non function is probably an overkill, 
So what you try to do is in the simplest form, you come fit in a straight line, which, which will be in the form y equals a plus uh, b1 x1, and say that I could, I'm going to use this straight line to predict basically when I don't know what, uh, what y will be given a new x. So you get a new x and I predict y. So that's really broadly speaking what we are trying to do in predictive analytics. We're trying to come up with a mathematical model that uh, basically shows you, uh, um, um, just one second, yeah, that this mathematical model basically that will allow, allow for, for future prediction. Looks very simple, right? And you might say, well, what's the value in this? But believe me, basically, there is a tremendous amount of value in simple models like this. Most of us try to find complex models, but actually the simpler models are the ones that work best. You saw that image recognition problem that I just uh, showed you, that face recognition stuff um, uh, in the New York Times article. In, the, in, in, in 20, 30 years back, when we used to work with image recognition, we used to well, code every pixel on that particular picture frame. Nowadays, we don't do that. We actually, what we do is we measure the distance between eyebrow to eyebrow, uh, between basically the, the, the top of the nose to the bottom of the nose, uh, the, the, the end of uh, the le one lip to the end of another lip, the size of the ear and so on and so forth. Take a few metrics from a face and use possibly a linear model like this and predict the face. That face prediction is better than basically taking each and every pixel from that particular face. Hard to believe, but that's that's the reality. Okay, so don't undermine the importance of uh, or the usefulness of very simple models. Okay, so why can we predict in? And so what is y and x over here? So let's take the banking example. Why can we predicting whether a transaction is fraudulent? Okay, and X1 can be a, a count of the amount of deviation from a normal transaction. So suppose normal transactions for this particular person is $300, and suddenly you see a $5,000 transaction. It's definitely more than, you know, it's abnormal, basically. So you point that out. So X could be just basically a deviation from the normal value of the transaction. Then X2 could be a geographical location abnormality. So for example, let's say all, our, all, our, all my transactions take place from Virginia, and then suddenly I see a transaction from Germany happening basically. Then that, that raises a flag. So it, it basically raises a flag called a geographical distance from Virginia to Germany basically, and that throws the model off and says, okay, there's, there's a problem going on, look at it. So even simple models like this can be used to make your you know, organization perform better. Now, uh, of course, now we can get into more complex models. We can create what are called decision tree models. And here's an example of that. Um, what it tries to do, and this is where AI, you're moving into the AI space from the statistics space. You try to iteratively split the data into small groups. And the goal is to maximize the distance between these groups and determine the best split. Forget about the algorithm and so on and so forth. Those are things that are not important. What does it really do? So suppose I have, suppose my data has five cases of credit example, of credit risk examples. Two are positive credit risk. I mean, positive credit risk meaning that you know a loan can be given, and three are poor risks. And suppose the metrics that I'm trying to use to predict good or good and poor is income, married, yes or no, or debt, high or low. So the dependent variables are what I'm trying to predict is the risk level, good or poor. So at the end of this particular analysis of this algorithm, what it will do is it will come up with a tree structure in the form of rules. If income is equal to low, then risk equals poor. If income equals high and married equals no, then risk equals poor. If income equals high and married equals yes, uh, risk, yes then risk equals good. So how sophisticated this model is going to be will be, uh, will be driven by the sophistication of your data. If you have a simple model like this with five cases, then you'll get a simple rule like this which may or may not work when you put it out of sample. But if you have a complex data set, if you have a, if you have a large data set with a lot of drivers uh, uh, that can determine basically uh, what the credit risk is going to be, then of course you're going to have a better model. So anyway, that's another class of models. And the third class of models is basically what is being extensively used in the AI domain, and this area is called machine learning. And well, they're all machine learning. Machine learning is nothing but basically the use of data by computers to learn from it. That's that's all 
what machine learning really means. Okay. So um, in this scenario, I'm doing something interesting. I'm saying that okay i am going to make my world is a lot more complicated it's not sim a simple linear relationship between x1 x2 x3 x4 the the metrics that i'm using to predict something so for example for face recognition i, I i'm using uh, say pixel pictures or whatever i'm basically using to do face recognition it's not a linear model okay so how can i take this model and make it more complicated well i can create what i call these what i what i call these hidden layers so i create what i call intermediate layers okay and these intermediate layers are basically new predictive variables taking x1 x2 x3 x4 new another new predictive variable y2 uh, creating an intermediate uh, pre predictive variable and so on and so forth so i create multiple y1 y2 y3 y4 y5 y5 and so on and so forth and then use that to essentially model the actual face recognition, um, uh, what you call uh, output. So what is the face recognition output? Just to give you some clarity. Well, here's a face. And here's uh, the name associated with the face. And that name might be Adam Smith. So your data set really has to have, the, have, the, have, have these two, the images of all the faces and the identification of all the faces. And the what the system is trying to do is to say or learn from the images and associate it with the identification. So now when a new face is given, then the system can go back from to what, what it's learned and then produce basically the identification. That's really all it is. But in order to, and that it goes back to the question that someone raised basically, can we rely upon this? Well, if you can rely upon this at 99% of the time, it recognizes faces that it has never seen before. Or 95% of the time and so on and so forth. Well, that's what we'll go into in that certificate program. And, and you know, that, that goes into a lot of details, basically. Okay, are, are all of you with me uh, uh, to this point? Doctor, there is another question I will just shoot. Uh... In predictive analysis, once the work done and you have set the programs, in actual operations, things do change with time. How will you manage to predict new situations that are affecting your production? Um, I believe this is from the oil and industry context because I know Ali who has posted this question, uh, oil and gas industry. Very good question. Now you, uh, uh, now you realize that the importance of the data, data world that I was talking about, remember, um, uh, uh, the models, the technology, the data, and then the domain. And the domain in this particular case is the oil industry. So if you look at the domain, basically, uh, sorry, if you look at the data component, basically, why do we need the data component? That's exactly why we need the data component, because the data component is not static, right? The data that you're providing, for example, if it was fraud uh, detection, or if it was, uh, you know, uh, um, illegal transactions or face recognition and so on and so forth. There, there's always dynamic data being poured into the system. So the system has to be constantly learning. And so basically the algorithm has to work in conjunction with the newer and newer data that essentially comes in. Now, there are two ways of doing that. You can do it as a batch processing method or you can do it as a dynamic, you know, real-time processing method, basically. Batch processing would essentially entail that you take the next 10 days data, run the algorithm again, and create a new model. If you want to want it to be dynamically processed, then basically you take the data as and when it comes in, change the algorithm as and when the data comes in, basically. The algorithm will produce models that will be dependent upon the data. So to answer your question, of course you'll have to assume that the data is dynamic. Otherwise, basically, if you used a, a lone default analysis model built from the 1990s uh, uh, today, then frankly speaking, it's not going to work. And your performance uh, of that model is going to be uh, really bad. So yes, clearly you'll have to be working with dynamic data. And that's the responsibility of the data managers or the data, data engineers. Okay. Okay. Common consumer applications of AI, you see it all the time. Uh, you've got uh, Siri on your uh, iPhone, Alexa that Amazon basically provides, Tesla, the, the uh, what do you call the 
the autonomous vehicle systems uh, use AI extensively. Netflix uses AI extensively to basically tell you which movies to watch. You can't even watch your own movies and search for them. It'll basically tell you to watch this movie. Uh, Amazon Echo, very similar to, um, to Alexa. Uh, Pandora, again, music selection based on AI. Nest thermostats based on AI, basically, you could control essentially the humidity or the uh, the temperature inside inside your house based i mean nest is not that sophisticated but it can do a little bit of ai based uh, what do you call uh, monitoring a uh, google home another example and then of course social media basically uses ai like crazy whether it's facebook twitter and so on uh, uber uh, uh, you know doordash all of them basically are using ai based applications some of these applications although we call them ai based applications they may not be using machine learning or when I say machine learning, you know, I just want to go back to this. This is where the world gets really complex when you use neural networks. This, this link to this imaginary file uh, faces that I talked about, that thing called uh, uh, generational uh, 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 adversarial network, basically, it is something that has been created in the last two years, okay? But it's a form of a neural network. And what, what, what was really happening is they were trying to improve face recognition systems by giving it faces that were not really the face that was associated with that particular identification. In the process, they learned that basically they could create new faces that were not real faces. So it was almost an accidental find the finding. It was not something that they were actually trying to do. They were using GANs to essentially do face recognition. Okay, so um, to go, going back to it, the sophistication of the algorithms and the models varies depending upon what you're trying to do, what the application is. So in a three-day uh, workshop intended towards executives who want to build an organization that is focused on data science and AI, and when I say organization, I mean basically a, a division, unit, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's impossible for us to basically, you know, make you um, experts in data science or AI or anything like that. That's not the purpose of this workshop. There are, if you wanted to basically develop skills in a particular area, and as I was telling you, the number of areas is massive. If you wanted to develop skills in a particular area, then you have to take a longer duration program, basically. Okay, and so those programs are also there, but, you know, uh, a lot of people in industry uh, want a quick return, basically, something that they can essentially use right away. Um, and that's why a shorter uh, duration program is, is, is possible and makes sense for people who have, you know, busy professionals who don't really have the time to spend nine, 10 months to learn a particular skill. And that may not be your objective. So what we do in these sessions, and of course it can be done in a three-day workshop, it can be done spread over, and now since everything is online, we can this can be spread over six weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever the case might be. So we would start, of course, there will be multiple faculty members involved because you know you you realize realize that the expertise comes from various areas. So you need statisticians, you need machine learning experts, you need nat and in machine learning also there are various components. Some people know natural language processing much better than they know image recognition. Some people know sentiment analysis much better, and so on and so forth. So we have to really Mix and match faculty. So we start off with an introduction uh, and what you should expect from the program. And then we give you a broad overview of data science and AI. Uh, then an introduction to, uh, again, the first three sessions really are introductory sessions, basically. Then we go into statistical models primarily. <clears throat> okay, there are various levels of statistical models that we talk about, talk about. And also use R because R kind of, you know, demonstrates basically how easy it is to use these statistical models. So we do that. Then within the within the AI component, there are, like I said, there are multiple classes of AI solutions. One broad classification is called classifying and clustering data. And so you you look at those algorithms. Uh, then you look at uh, you know machine learning, especially neural network applications. But you know neural networks also have a lot of different forms in which they come. Um, and um, so we look at computer vision examples, image recognition examples, uh, natural language processing examples. As far as data engineering is concerned, we don't spend a whole lot of time on it, but basically there is one module that focuses on the data and the preparation of the data and the importance of that. So there is one module focused on that. 
this uh, is, is NLP and text mining, sentiment analysis and stuff like that would be covered over here. <coughs> and then finally, applications. So analysis of identified features in different case studies, basically, uh, sample models. And then um, lastly, basically, uh, the faculty will expect you to do some research uh, or do some projects on your own. These projects may not be hands-on projects because, you know, in a three-day session like this, you can't really do hands-on projects. But at least to come up with an analysis to show how you can apply what you learned in your in practice uh, when you go back to your uh, go back to your workplaces. <coughs> so I think one of the questions that might come up is who is this program for? So I've been saying executives and managers who wish to know more of our data science and AI applications, career switches who would like to move into this functional area so that they understand what they're moving into before they actually move into it, professionals looking to apply data science and AI to address business problems or grow, grow new opportunities. For example, if you want to look at oil, you know, opportunities in the oil industry, you can, uh, you can do that basically. If you want to look at uh, uh, look at procurement and manufacturing, you can look at, look at that. And we will, uh, depending upon the type of students we get, we will essentially get functional experts in one or more of these areas. Um, organizations planning to build a data science and AI team. Again, for senior, to mid-level executives who are planning to do this, this would be an extremely good course to understand what is involved in building this organization, basically. And who do we, you know, how do we build, build this team together and how do we apply, the, apply what you've learned over here uh, to your business problems. And this is also good for those people who are contemplating skill development in data science and AI, okay? And I call it the first stage of skill development in data science and AI. Uh, the skill development required in data science and AI is massive, basically. You can't really address all of them. And if you try to all of, address all of them and you come to, a, come to an interview or come to a you know, job situation and you say that I'm a data science and AI expert, if the person knows what, you, what you're talking about, he's probably going to laugh, laugh you off. So you have to, if you're focusing on skill development, you have to focus on what type of skill development do I be? Am, am I going to focus on natural language processing? Am I going to focus on uh, deep learning? Am I going to focus on statistical analysis? Uh, what am I going to focus on? You, you need to basically, you know, have that clear in your mind, essentially. And this program sort of helps you understand the environment and then say, okay, fine, this is where I think I need to move towards, okay? What kind of background do you need? So given that, the background required is you have to have a strong interest in data science and AI applications in business. That's really the most important background that you need. If you don't have an interest in this area, then obviously you're wasting time, right? So in terms of academic background, undergraduate degree in any field, because you, know, you, have, to be, you have to have a basic understanding of the components uh, okay, in, this, uh, in this area. An open mind and a willingness to learn and, and you should be open to communicating with others and a willingness to explore new ideas. Your classmates are very vital, basically, in this particular initiative because they are the ones from where you learn a lot of the application areas and how they plan to use it. The faculty will come in and bring in the theory and the applications that they... So it's really a team-based learning environment. And lastly, you have to be able to do additional hours of work outside the classroom. Without that, you're not going to be able to absorb a lot of the, a lot of the material. Okay. Thank you. And uh, any other questions? I'd be happy to take them. Sorry, I took much longer than I thought I would, uh, but uh, my apologies for that. Back to you, Naveen. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sen. There is one question. Uh, but I would request uh, uh, people to post uh, questions. Uh, perhaps. Uh, we could take a few more over the next five minutes or so while we wrap. Uh, there was a question about is is data mining and data profiling the same approach? Would you like to take that one? So data mining is another you know word, buzzword that used to be used um, in the 90s and maybe in the 2000s uh, era. Um, so uh, again, think about the terminology data mining. So you're taking data and you're mining or essentially you're trying to abstract some information from that data that is that is going to be useful for you. Yeah. What are the techniques and methods used for used to do that? Exactly the same techniques and methods that I just talked about. It's either going to be statistics, 
natural language processing, it could be decision trees, it could be uh, machine learning, it could be adapt, you know, other forms of adaptive algorithms. So basically, that's what data mining really means. So, uh, so data mining is not a concept that's uh, largely different from what we just talked about. And what was your other question, uh, data mining and something else? What was the other one, uh, Naveen? Uh, the, sorry, <laughs> I lost it. Uh, data mining and data profiling. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by data profiling. Um, so I don't know uh, how to address that question. Um, is it basically, again, you know, if, you, if I just look at the word data profiling, basically what we are again trying to do is to make some sense out of the data. And how do you make sense out of the data? Again, use these models to make sense out of the data. So what you do to profile your data depends upon the models and the technologies that you're going to be using. So these are, if you look at these terms, they don't really mean anything until basically you go out and solve an actual business problem. Okay. So data profiling, if, if, the, if what, what you're trying to do, let's say if you're doing data profiling, what is the end result for the data profiling? What are you, what are you trying to achieve? Then the question is, can I achieve that by just visualizing the data? Or by you, do I need more sophisticated models to, uh, to make sense of the data? So that all basically goes into the, the modeling environment. So without understanding what data profiling is or what you're trying to achieve through data profiling, I really can't uh, address that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sain. Is there any other questions anyone would like to uh, address? Uh, I'll just pause for a couple of minutes while I pull up the concluding slide. Uh, okay. Any other questions, kindly keep uh, posting. Uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Sain with us to uh, take them. Uh, okay, so on a concluding note, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the certification course is uh, around the corner. This is the maiden course we are launching in uh, collaboration with Virginia Tech. And uh, uh, you will receive a certificate in data science and AI. And uh, uh, so, uh, of course, we would love to do this in a classroom setting. That's what the course is originally designed for. Uh, it's faculty led and uh, completely uh, engaging session, but of course it's going to be done in an, in an online format and we've been debating, uh, you know, about what is the most effective way to deliver this and we feel uh, uh, we feel the ideal format is to limit each session to about three hours long because that's in our experience uh, the most uh, we can retain people's attention and energy level. So we have split it into six modules uh, each uh, that is three hours long uh, and uh, um, and spread over three weekends. And the dates are in front of you. Uh, we are happy to take our discussion offline. Sunny, my colleague, uh, can touch base with you if you or your colleagues would like to sign up for this course or if, if your organization would like to go in with a group of people, we are happy to uh discuss uh, possible ways to make that happen um i see another question posted uh, okay all right that was sunny so uh that's all from us uh, i'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, dr sain for taking the time for uh, enlightening us on this uh, valuable subject of uh, data science ai and machine learning uh, there have been a lot of uh, myths around this subject and uh, too many buzzwords Mission floating posted, around. Uh, uh, okay. I myself oh, was, uh, you know, so, uh, that's all from us. Looking up some of the I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, and, uh, Dr. Singh for very taking the time to fight the subject for uh, enlightening us on this uh, uh, it was a valuable subject session. of uh, thank data you, science, for AI, and machine the learning. Uh, there the have been a lot uh, I guess on that note, we can wrap this session and uh, looking forward to more conversations in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and uh, thanks for bringing this uh, opportunity to us. It was uh, good talking to all of you and I, I do appreciate the questions because that does uh, uh, make my, my life more interesting. Uh, thank you again for participating in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sain. Thanks, everyone.
during in this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Thanks, everyone.